Hi, everybody. Um, so how I got interested in this was um, one aspect of my role is working with the organization to help them reorient in terms of how we recruit, because one of our main goals is obviously creating a diverse workforce. And so what I did was you hear a lot of times from recruiters and people searching for diversity that they have, they have difficulty finding diverse candidate pools. So what I finally did is I sat down with one of my colleagues in recruiting who was doing a, a, a Boolean search on LinkedIn. And he put in all the technical requirements that were needed for the role. And when he did his initial search, what was interesting to me was that the first thing that came up were a page full of Caucasian males, which is fine. And I said, okay, let's do something a little different. Let's take that search, keep all the technical requirements that you have, and let's add in the Society of Women Engineers. For those of you who don't know, it's an organization here in the United States that focuses on women's participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. All of a sudden, what I saw was a page full of women who hadn't come up on that first search at all. And I said, okay, let's do something a little different too. Let's take out Society of Women Engineers and let's put in Florida International University. For those of you who don't know, Florida, Inter Florida International University based in Florida, obviously, has a large Hispanic population. All of a sudden, a page full of Hispanic engineers came up who, again, hadn't come up on the first search. Now, what's interesting to me are not the last two searches. To me, that's pretty obvious as to why that would happen. What was interesting to me was the first search, because the first search was the default. What I find is that with machine learning and artificial intelligence, what it's generally designed to do is to give me a seamless experience, something that's not disruptive in any way. And as a result, if in the very beginning stages, we're not thinking about diversity and how it's integrated and is it a part of things, it has the potential and the danger of making entire groups and people irrelevant. It also provides an opportunity for us, and we'll talk about some of those things in a proactive way, but I think at the beginning, one of the things that we have and what we've seen so far, unfortunately, a lot of cautionary tales, and I'll share some of that with you as we go through this. Okay? When we think about where there are opportunities to integrate diversity into the work around artificial intelligence, there are really three main areas. One is in the lab, so the people who work on things together. Um, the second is in the data, because as we all know, machine learning and AI are powered by data that we have. So what about our data sets, and are we thinking about integrating diversity into the data sets that we have? And then finally, the third place is the end user. So who's actually using what we create with AI? Okay. And when I talk about diversity, um, we really think about diversity at Autodesk in terms of three different dimensions. One is human diversity, and those are the things about us that, are, um, that tend to be more physically related characteristics, so things like my ethnicity, uh, my sex, my age, my sexual orientation, so on and so forth. Um, the second category is cultural diversity. Cultural diversity has to do with things that are very core to who I am, um, but don't necessarily manifest themselves in a physical form. So things like language, um, things like my working style, my thinking style, my religion. They're very core to who I am, but they're changeable. And then finally, the last piece is systems diversity, and that's how systems interact with each other within an organization. Now, the reason why I share this is that just like any business process with artificial intelligence, the one thing, if you don't take anything else away from our time this morning and talking about this, is that you can take this template and ask yourself at any point in the process, is there an element of human, cultural, or systems diversity that we haven't considered in what we're trying to do? If you, if you use that template as a question, that'll help bring to a level of consciousness questions around diversity and inclusion so that you don't run into things unconsciously. And unfortunately, what we have is typically this when we start out with a team. So most of you recognize this. Anybody recognize which show this is from? Okay, Silicon Valley. It's from Silicon Valley. And the reason why this team looks like this is that this is the typical team that you see in Silicon Valley, in technology companies. Um, now, to me, one thing that's a, an assumption about any project or any group that's working on anything is that I only have the, abil the, the ability to tap into the creativity of whomever is around the table. So the more diverse mindsets I have, the more different perspectives, ideas, thoughts, contributions that will be available to me. Okay? Now what I was talking about was cautionary tales, tales earlier, and that's what we tend to have a lot of right now in AI, because it's still relatively young in terms of its development. So you've heard about things like this, AI programs learning to exclude some African-American voices, diversity in crisis, machines taught by photos to learn a sexist view of women. 
Um, Google Photos, you heard about this one, I'm sure, the, the, they started tagging African Americans, um, the facial recognition software tagged African Americans as gorillas. Okay? What we're hoping for is that if you start to think about diversity and inclusion in an active way, this is your headline, which is that there isn't one. That's really the ultimate goal, that diversity is an integrated part of what you do and how you operate versus something that we have to deal with in a retroactive way down the line. Now, when we think about having a diverse team, um, it's not necessarily easier. There's some key benefits that I think we can talk about. Um, one is that they focus on facts and they process facts more carefully. They tend to be more innovative and they eventually have an ability to, um, to deal with conflict that tends to be a little bit stronger than teams that aren't diverse. Now, the reason why, I have to say, is that it's not a nirvana. In fact, it's more difficult at the beginning because there's a rite of passage you have to go through. There is more ground for conflict to begin with. I don't know about you, but when I have somebody who has an entirely different opinion than I do, it's not necessarily my first reaction to say, that's a great idea, let's forget about my idea and use yours instead. Usually my first reaction is to try and defend my idea and advocate for my idea. And so the question is how do I create an environment where we can do that and still come to some joint result together that's more productive in the end. The one thing I will say about these things is that once you do go through these rites of passage at the beginning, the end result ends up being much better. I know for me, I've had a personal experience just recently here at Autodesk with a colleague of mine who has a very different mindset than myself. And she and I had very opposing opinions on something. It took a while for us to work through it and it took a lot of trust, but once we got through it, we actually ended up with a better result than either one of us could have done on our own. And in addition to that, she's now the number one person who I try to include on every project. She probably regrets being so helpful now because now I try to bring her into everything because she has a mindset um, that I don't have and things that I'm missing. And this is the opportunity again with artificial intelligence to ask those questions early on. The dangers of diversity with that, of not thinking about diversity in the beginning are some of those things that we talked about before. We already talked about the Google um, photos before. There was also a Carnegie Mellon study, and these are just, again, examples. A Carnegie Mellon study that showed that far fewer women than men were shown Google ads for high paying jobs. Um, and then a very famous one is around defendants being flagged. So there, there are artificial intelligence tools that are being used to flag flag recidivism, so the probability that people will return to prison, and they actually falsely flagged people who are African American as being more likely to return to prison versus some people who, who were Caucasian who actually were high risk, but because of the way the questions were designed and the fact that there wasn't diversity in at the beginning, people asking those questions resulted in something like this. Again, the opportunity is there. The question is, am I proactive and conscious about trying to create diversity from the very beginning in terms of my team? The second place is in the data. So as we know, all AI is powered by data. It's only as good as the data that we have. And the question, the ultimate question with the data is how wide or how narrow do we go? Because that determines how something's gonna go in a certain direction. That becomes really important from the beginning. So every artificial intelligence tool, every machine learning tool has a default. Okay? And so that default, if we don't think about and integrate diversity in terms of the data that we're getting from the beginning, then it has the potential to make whole groups of people irrelevant. This can actually also have legal consequences too. Because as you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a danger sometimes with artificial, artificial intelligence of having a tyranny of, of the majority. So if we look at just the things, if you look at a bell curve of data, and I know not all data is a perfect bell curve, but if you conceive of a bell curve of data, we tend to look at this, the big hump in the bell curve, not the things on the end. And the problem is that the, the pieces on the ends, a lot of times are people and groups that are smaller in number or smaller in significance. And if we don't take them into account to begin with, they have a danger of not being able to participate in the long term. So we have two, really goal, two real goals around inclusion. One is to try, make the full spectrum of end users relevant to the system. And I know it's saying the same thing, but in a reverse way to some extent, is make the system relevant to the full spectrum of potential end users. So it's kind of saying the same thing, but from a different mindset and a different perspective. Okay? An example of the first one is using AI to screen job applicants. Um, what are the types of things and measures that I put into place from the very beginning? Because obviously, if I do certain pieces, if I focus on certain very specific schools that may or may not have anything to do with somebody's ability to be successful, are there whole groups that don't become a part of the process from the beginning? 
And, we are, and one of the things that we also talked about a little bit was facial recognition. There have been facial recognition tools on the other end where to actually be recognized by it, people who were developers who were people of color actually had to put on a white mask to be recognized by the tool. Okay. So when I'm, am I thinking about these things from the beginning? Again, a lot of what I'm talking about here is asking questions from the very beginning. Okay. Again, we're talking about cautionary tales. We'll talk about proactive and opportunities in the beginning, I mean, in the end. Now, dangers of not thinking about the customer base and the end user with respect to diversity um, and artificial intelligence. This is an AI-powered tool at work. Okay? This is one where if we don't have people asking those questions, we can have, again, cautionary tale results. So this was in South Africa. This was a tool that was designed to vacuum a house on a regular basis. Now, what they did, of course, was create it based on a Western mindset, which is that people sleep on mattresses that are raised. Well, in other parts of the world, for example, South Korea, some people sleep on futons, which are on the floor. And so as a result, this woman was attacked by the robot and ended up having to have the fire department come in to actually remove it from her hair. Okay? Now, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, if you have somebody asking the question again at the very beginning, okay, are we thinking about the whole world and how how this will function not only in Germany or the United States or Canada, but in other parts of the world, and there are, unique thi are there unique things that we haven't thought of? And even more powerful, if there is somebody who's actually from that part of the world to ask the question, because I can't be necessarily a proxy for somebody. I can try, but there's nothing better than to have somebody who actually represents whatever element or whatever dimension of diversity I'm really interested in integrating. If you have somebody to ask that question, then this doesn't necessarily happen again. Okay? Now, when we want to summarize how to do it, okay, because people always ask, well, what do you do? I'm always really interested in takeaways. The first thing is having diverse teams of developers. So I hear a lot of talk about pipeline issues. Um, and are there, in terms of numbers, less of certain diverse groups than other people? Absolutely. But most organizations that I know in technology have not maxed out what the available pipeline is. So to give you some numbers, um, in terms of engineers, at least in CS and in mechanical engineering in the United States, women graduate at a rate of about 17 or 18%, depending upon the study that you look at. African Americans graduate at a rate of about 5% of the total population. And Hispanics graduate at a rate of about nine, eight or 9%. So if your organization isn't there, then you haven't necessarily maxed out the pipeline that's available. So one thing is to be really direct and specific and deliberate about creating diverse teams. And there are ways to do that. For us at Autodesk, what, it ended up result what we've done is actually started to change our focus in terms of how we recruit. And we started to recruit at some universities that we didn't reach out to, like the University of Texas El Paso, which graduates 500 engineers per year, 77% of whom are Hispanic, and Howard University, which graduates about three or 400 engineers per year, about 80 to 90 percent who are African American. We hadn't recruited there before. Now we do, and now we're starting to see the results of it in terms of our pipeline. So this is possible. It just requires thinking about things a little bit differently and being disruptive. The second is diverse data sets. And we talked about that already. The last piece that I think, though, if you, if you, again, if you don't take anything away, Think about that template that I shared at the beginning, that human, cultural, and systems diversity in terms of those dimensions. And at any stage in your process, the thing about artificial intelligence is that it's not, just because it's AI doesn't mean it's not subject to the same rigor that we would apply to any business process. I think a lot of times we see it as a silver bullet and don't apply that same kind of discipline to it. And so one of the things that is incumbent upon us if we really want to take advantage in a proactive way of the full market and the full potential of what's out there is to ask ourselves at every stage of the process, is there some element of human, cultural, or systems diversity that we haven't considered yet? That's really the opportunity. It doesn't have to be a cautionary tale necessarily. But we're in the early stages, so I'm excited to look for some proactive stories of, of how people have taken advantage of it. Thanks so much.